My name is Emmanuel, and with me today is Rohit. Over the past decade, um, we have been in different roles from security research to pen testing to rate teaming, and recently security engineering. So the stuff that we'll be talking today is based on our experience and perspective from these different roles. Now, container is a very broad topic. There's so much to talk about, and we can't possibly cover everything today. Um, instead, what we are going to do is to focus on just the Docker and the Kubernetes environment. We'll go through some common examples of vulnerabilities that we see from breaking out of these containers to lateral movement. And today, we would also be releasing a tool called the Docker Exploitation Toolkit. This is basically a collection of mini tools that we have created. Um, it follows the Unix philosophy whereby each tool does just one thing, but does it well. Now, as a pen tester, as a rate teamer, very often the first instance that you realize you are in a Dockerized environment is when you actually gain remote code execution. You compromise an application and you realize that, hey, you are in a restricted environment. And the goal now is to actually break out and escape out of this restricted environment. And as a pen tester, as a red teamer, um, it really makes our life easier when we realize that a container is running in privileged mode. For those of you guys who have been dealing with Docker for a while, I'm sure you have seen people running Docker containers with dash dash privilege, or maybe like even you are guilty of this yourself. Um, but what is this? What is this dash dash privilege? Why is it bad? To understand that, you got to realize that when you run Docker, by default, it comes with a whole bunch of restriction. Um, there's restricted Linux capabilities, there's seccom to filter and restrict syscall, there's app armor to restrict mount operations and preventing write access to sensitive locations. Now, all of this goes away when you run a container in privileged mode. But as a developer, what does it really mean, right? I mean, we know that it's not too good from a security perspective, but from a pragmatic perspective, what does it really mean for me? What this means is that the exploit, the breakout of a privileged container can fit in a single tweet. I'll, I'll let that sink in for a moment. That's 140 characters to break out of a privileged container. Now, this was initially disclosed by Felix Wilhelm, a um, really smart guy. And even though it's only 140 characters, there's actually a lot of things that's happening behind the scene. And I'm going to break it down for you. The first step is to try and figure out a mapping between the file system in the container and the file system in the host. Say, for example, if within a container, you create a file called exploit.sh, it is possible to reference this exact same file from the host itself. But obviously the path from the host is going to be different because they are mounted differently. So the first step is to actually try and figure out the mapping of the file system between the container and the host. Now, the second step is to find C group with release agent. C group or control groups are basically kernel features that enforces limits and constraints. For example, you can limit the memory using C group for a specific container, right? And the way to interact with this C group is through like a pseudo file system. And within C group, there's a special configuration called release agent. This is basically a mechanism whereby it gets triggered when there's no more processors running in the C group. Um, this is a feature that people use for cleanup or for monitoring or for alert. So this step, this second step is to figure out which are the C groups with a release agent available. 
And now the third step is to actually configure the release agent to run the exploit.sh we created in step one. Um, the path for this file needs to be from the host point of view, which is why we need to figure out the path mapping in step one. Now, typically writing and configuring the release agent is not possible in a Docker container because it is only, it's read only. But in privileged mode, this becomes read write. So you can use that to configure the release agent. Next, the next step is to actually enable that release agent via notify on release. Basically, once you enable this, it says that, hey, when there's no more processors running in that C group, notify the release agent. Again, typically you can't write to this, but in a privileged container, you get read write capability for this. And the final step is to actually tie all of this together. Um, first, you start the process, you add it to a child C group and immediately exits. So now there's no process tied to that C group. This triggers the release agent because notify on release is set to enable. And once that release agent is triggered, it runs your export to SH. And ladies and gentlemen, this is how you break out of a privileged container in 140 characters. So now, now you know that, hey, it's really easy and trivial to break out of a privileged container. You got to be wondering like, who runs container in privileged mode, right? I mean, this is actually more common than you think. When you run a tool in containers, say for example, TCP dump, and you want to use certain configuration, some of these Docker default restrictions actually stops you from doing that. So the proper way of doing this is to figure out what are the, the Linux capabilities that you need. There's probably a little bit of trial and error here. Or you can just run your container in privileged mode and everything just works. And humans tend to choose the path of least resistance, right? If you do a quick search on GitHub, you'll notice that there's about 140,000 of containers running in privileged mode. So that gives you a sense that, hey, this is not as uncommon as you think it is. The next misconfiguration of vulnerability that I want to talk about is regarding Docker socket. Um, Docker socket, when you install Docker, by default, it creates this uh, unique socket. And this is the interface through which you talk and interact with the Docker daemon. Say on the CLI, you do a Docker pool or Docker run or Docker start. It talks to this unique socket and tell the Docker daemon what to do. And the thing is that this Docker daemon runs as root. So it is highly privileged, which means that access to this Docker socket needs to be restricted. Sometimes we see that people actually mount this Docker socket within containers itself. And, and this is bad because this means that within the container, you can now talk to the Docker daemon and ask it to do stuff. Using this, you can actually break out of the container or even like escalate your privileges within the host itself. And I'm just going to give a quick demo of a tool that we created to help to do this exploit um, easily. And this tool is called Houdini. Okay, in this terminal, we are inside a container. And what we are doing now is that we are running the Houdini tool. And this tool, it checks for a couple of different vulnerabilities or misconfiguration within the container itself. And Houdini doesn't try to assume that it has tools like curl and stuff like that, because within the container, very often you don't have access to tools that we take for granted and so what we do is that we bring in our own tools that is needed for the exploit uh, whether whether is it busy box or is it like a drop bear 
So we don't make any assumption on the tools required or, or the tools that are actually contained within the container. And in this case, what we are doing is that we are going to exploit it by attacking the Docker socket. Um, we use it to start a container, mount the host file system, copy a SSH key into the, the host file system, and then we should be able to SSH from the container into the host system. There we go. Okay. And again, if you do a quick search on GitHub, you will see that there's a whole bunch of, there's like 30,000 instances whereby people are actually mounting Docker socket. So again, this is not that uncommon. Now, sometimes when you're on a security assessment, and you find that, hey, you can't actually break out of a container. And that's where lateral movement comes in really useful. The next area I'm gonna talk about is around Docker registry. In particular, images within the Docker registry. Or to be even more precise, the file system layers in uh, image itself. When you run Docker on the CLI, they do like a Docker pool. You'll notice like a whole bunch of hashes flying past the screen. These are, this is just the Docker pulling all the file system layers um, to run the container. Now, something to note is that Docker uses a union-based file system. If you're running an older version of Docker, you're probably running AUFS. If you're running a newer version, probably you're running overlay FS. But the underlying concept is the same. Um, the file system is based on layers. You start with a base layer. Say you install a, a software, it creates a new layer on top of it. And then you might configure, set certain configurations, set certain secrets, it creates another layer. Have you guys wondered like what happens when you try to delete a file? So in a union file system, when you try to delete a file, it doesn't actually delete the file itself. Instead, what happens is that it creates a whiteout layer that basically hides the file. And you start building your layers upon layers uh, um, based on that. So the file itself is actually never ever deleted. And as part of our research, we created a tool called Scavenger. What it does is that it analyzes all the file system layers in a image and it looks for white out layers. And the premise is that, hey, if you are deleting something, maybe you are hiding something as well. So it goes through all these file system layers, identify the white out, um, and then extract the deleted file from one of the underlying layers. So this particular attack surface area, I think a lot of security professionals probably know about this at the back of their mind. Um, but as far as I know, um, we don't think a lot of people are actually talking about this or even actively searching for these whiteouts. So this is a tool that I think will be helpful on your assessment. So let me give a quick demo of this tool. What you are seeing here is scavenger which is part of the Docker exploitation toolkit. And the way it works is that you point it at the registry, tell it to pull an image, let's say Ubuntu, right? And by default, it will pull the latest image from the repo. In this case, let's give it an older version of Ubuntu. And basically what it's trying to do is that it would get the image for this version, analyze the file system layers and point out if there's any deleted files 
okay so you can see here each of this SHA-256 hash represents one layer in the file system so there's a total of five layers it has analyzed and you will see that for this particular layer there's a whole bunch of files that were deleted or wiped out and there's some smart to this tool whereby it tries to give you some indication on potentially sensitive files so in this case there's a warning sign that say hey take a look at this gpg file perhaps there's something sensitive on this and by clicking on the link uh, what it does is that it tries to extract the file from one of the layers underneath the whiteout and you can take you can see that in this case it extracted the pgp signature file for this particular instance it's not sensitive but it does give you an indication as to what the tool does how it actually analyzes the different file system layers and extract those files now let me show you some actual files we have grabbed from images public images on docker hub um, they range from the more mundane license keys to private ssh keys so these are actual files you grab from images on docker hub um, this has been deleted but using scavenger we could extract them out and now i'm going to hand over to rohit and he's going to cover more about lateral movement from the kubernetes perspective over to you rohit all right thanks emmanuel so after peeking into the uh, container uh, breakouts uh, Let's walk through a strategy by which a red teamer or pen testers can actually perform lateral movements or, and then eventually maintain persistence in a Dockerized production grade environment. Uh, now, in case of a production grade environment, uh, you won't see isolated uh, Docker images, but you will always need some kind of uh, orchestration uh, systems for that. And that's typically needed because uh, you have hundreds of these uh, Docker containers uh, to manage. Now, in all these uh, orchestration systems, there are a bunch of them. And uh, in this talk, we are going to focus mainly on Kubernetes-based uh, attacks and uh, ways to actually defend it uh, for that. So the Kubernetes uh, provides a way to manage the cluster of uh, these containers. Uh, so it provides an easy to use APIs where you can scale up, scale down the different parts of the containers. It also provides the self-healing capabilities and there is a good overall community uh, support uh, around Kubernetes. So as a quick refreshers, because these terminologies will come uh, time to time in our discussion, uh, a few, few terminologies specific to Kubernetes. So the Kubernetes has a concept of nodes. So the nodes are nothing but uh, hosts, could be the physical hosts or virtual machines on which uh, your containerized environment is uh, uh, executing. And then it also introduces a one more layer of abstraction called as pods. So the pods provide a way to run one or more containers that provide a similar kind of functionality. So these pods are then scheduled to run on nodes that is on the uh, host uh, systems. A few, few, just a few minor uh, details uh, to remember. Uh, now all this overall Kubernetes based environment is gonna add a lot more burden in your already expanded threat surface. Because uh, as you have seen in Emmanuel's talk, uh, there are a bunch of ways in which you can break out the container and you, are, you already have to worry about a lot more defenses uh, in those. Things are gonna get more complicated when you are uh, in a Kubernetes production grid environment because there is a now authentication and authorization control that you have to manage uh, the way in which these pods communicate with each other, communicate with their APIs and all of that. Kubernetes also has a control plane API server, which exposes the bunch of API. And these are powerful APIs because they provide a way to manage the entire cluster. You need to uh, worry about the security of them. And then as usual, like uh, many uh, frameworks, the defaults are uh, often insecure uh, in general. And then uh, it is your responsibility as a security professional uh, to carefully threat model it and then provide a way to actually defend against the uh, different uh, attacks uh, for that. So 
let's 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 uh, walk through uh, a technique uh, to uh, perform the lateral movement and then eventually maintain the persistence uh, note uh, now note that though this technique is specific to kubernetes uh, you can pretty much apply the same principles for uh, any of the production grade uh, orchestrated orchestration uh, framework be it like a docker swarm or any of the cloud native environment so let's assume uh, a typical uh, organization setup uh, where you have the corp environment and to add more complications let's consider it to be the segmented environment not the flat network so now you have the corp environment there is a firewall and then the organization is using let's say the kubernetes based production environment to the right side and there is a firewall in between now as 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 as, as we just saw the in a kubernetes you have this pods that runs the bunch of the containers now in order to manage the life cycle of these containers you should have some kind of a docker registry and security savvy organizations can actually have a some internal docker registry or they could use different uh, cloud services uh, for that so if the if the attacker is already in the corp environment maybe by social engineering some of the employees or by by maybe exposing some of the services which is exposed to the internet unpatched not none of that is actually the unreasonable scenario so once attacker actually gets foothold in corp environment uh, in order to pivot themselves from corp environment to the prod uh, they can uh, use this uh, docker uh, registry for that so attacker has a different choices uh, at this uh, at this time uh, first they can use uh, some of the attacks uh, that emmanuel was demonstrating like the file overlays uh, in the operating systems uh, and then uh, using some of the deleted docker images that might have some sensitive uh, details might be some vulnerable docker images or they can they upload the docker image of their own choice so any of this technique uh, let's say that attacker uh, is able to upload the docker image of their choice and let's let's add a few a few things here like uh, they want to run themselves as a root but again remember that it's actually the root in a containerized uh, system and that docker image uh, might be vulnerable to any of the attack like the rc or any of the attack that uh, you can think of and then attacker can wait and uh, hope that their image is actually getting deployed using kubernetes in the production environment so this is how they finally got their foothold from a corp environment to the prod environment so by by, by foothold i mean they just have a one container running in the production uh, environment may be running as a root uh, for that matter sure you are uh, your root uh, but you are in the container uh, for that so it's like a king in the chain what you can do at that point because now you have a foothold in the production environment you can do some traditional things like you can do the network scan now one thing to remember here it's uh, the kubernetes is an orchestration system a traditional ways of uh, performing a network assessment and then having a enforced network ACLs is still your responsibility kubernetes is not going to provide you it by default in fact bunch of the pods that are deployed in kubernetes environments will be able to freely talk to each other so the network scan is something an attacker is going to try definitely whenever they have some foothold in prod environment they can try container breakouts uh, remember the containers are now pushed to the pod which is a one more Uh, abstraction layer in kubernetes so the three techniques that uh, emmanuel discussed for the container breakouts all of them are still applicable uh, in this environment so those can be uh, tried out uh, in this uh, in, in this situation then then they can actually try to compromise the api server so the kubernetes provides uh, a control api server uh, which has the bunch of the plugins uh, it has its own uh, marketplace in which people can push the different uh, plugins there might be vulnerabilities in that it might be unpatched it might be just left uh, uh, insecure uh, for that so compromising the api server is still an option but in all these things that you can see uh, it's it's really not helping you much as a lateral movement or to maintain your foothold or to maintain your persistence within the production environment though these techniques are uh, somewhat easier uh, it's not getting the complete fruit for an attacker for that so at the last resort what they can try to do is they can then try to evade the uh, the very basic uh, security uh, security uh, defense that has been added that is to evade the role based access controls 
and it could be in the form of service tokens that they can use. So what are these service tokens? Uh, so this pods, as uh, we were uh, discussing, is the abstraction layer that Kubernetes uh, provides on which your containerized in, uh, uh, images are running. Now, in order for these pods to talk to the control API as well as to other pods, they need to have a, something called as a bearer token. In a Kubernetes environment, it's service tokens. And this service token is usually found at this location, uh, which is in the in the screen. It's it's standard across all the uh, all, all all the pods uh, for that. Now the pods, just like a Linux, they are associated with a namespace, and the service tokens are associated with a pod. In turn, they are also associated uh, with namespace. Now what we have seen in general and uh, overall uh, overall issue that could happen uh, here is this. Custom namespaces can create a custom service tokens, and often a time, uh, your DevOps pipeline or overall people want to be more faster uh, deployment. This custom service tokens might have more permissive role. Now there are a lot of devastating role that you can assign to the service tokens, like creating a pod, updating a pod, or deleting a pod. Meaning, whoever gets hold of this service token, that pod or that adversary can now invoke the control API uh, to perform those actions, all those authorization associated with those um, uh, service tokens for that. So the create pod is like one of the uh, sensitive permission uh, in that case. Now these service tokens are also mountable, meaning if your pod has a spe specific service token, and if you are considering uh, security from the beginning, and then now you want to share this service token across a different pods in the same namespace, you can make them as a mountable service token so that the other pods, when they are scheduled, can just mount this service token and then they assume the same role that is already available for them. So by default, the service tokens are mountable. So imagine a situation uh, where you are able to create a pod and then mount a service token, which is of a much more higher privilege than you would have originally got. That, that that's like mounting the file system in case of a, a dockerized uh, environment. So to add to the agony here, so the root privilege container, so even if you are a root uh, within the container and we are calling it as the king in the jail, this specific uh, path that where the service tokens are uh, present, by default, you can read that if you are root and if you are root. If you are not a root within the container, then Kubernetes will not let you uh, read this uh, path. But that's not a foolproof solution. There are a bunch of ways in which uh, it's like a pseudo. You can su uh, try to pseudo within the Kubernetes world and try to read this uh, service token path. So getting hold of this service token once you have a pod deployed in Kubernetes is not a difficult job. Uh, any, any seasoned pen tester or red teamer would be able to eventually get to that. And if these service tokens are of a higher privilege, then that's a recipe for the complete uh, compromise. Uh, so let's take uh, like after this discussion and a general understanding, let's let's consider a one uh, lateral movement example for that. So as we have seen, uh, the attacker already at, at, attacker is able to deploy the Docker image with a root. Uh, so that container with a root is already present and they deployed the pod. So now they are within the containerized environment, Kubernetes environment with a, with a container and they have the root privilege for that. Now with that, if that pod has a service token uh, permission, which lets them create the pod, then attacker can actually deploy the pod. Now while deploying the pod, uh, the Kubernetes gives you a nice way to mount whatever file system that you want uh, for that matter. So here we are gonna use uh, one of the attack that Emmanuel uh, described where, hey, I have, I want to actually deploy the pod and in the container, which is on that pod, I want to actually mount the docker.sock uh, or uh, socket environment uh, for that, which will then let me uh, talk directly to the Docker daemon, which is running as a root uh, as, as we discussed. So this is as good as like a privileged uh, container for me in the uh, production environment. In order to think, in order to make things more easier, Kubernetes also lets you create privileged container. Uh, 
now the privileged containers or the privileged pod they basically share the same concept or the same theory that you can now host you can now mount the host file system and then you have a direct foothold to the kernel like at that point you have a direct access to the kernel for that so an attacker with this uh, logic will be able to deploy the pod of their own choice and then start compromising the one node at a time to eventually perform the lateral movement and then have their persistence in a containerized environment for that so, so all that whatever we discussed uh, the, it it's it's nothing uh, it's nothing new or it's it's not like uh, uh, it's a it's a new uh, information that uh, we are we are giving you but where it lacks uh, in general from the offensive security perspective is there are not lot of tools that let you do this so imagine you are already in a containerized environment and now you want to actually automate all of that so that then you can focus on real things like breaking out of container or maintain the persistence or perform the lateral movement there are a bunch of choices uh, that are there and there are isolated tools present but uh, th there is not a single framework uh that lets you plug all these tools and then create a coherent uh, framework for the um, containerized uh, uh, environment so that's the uh, contribution that we think uh, we are going to make here so we are going to uh, present our tool uh, the tool uh, uh, tool shiva so this tool uh, once you are within the containerized uh, environment uh, is going to try the bunch of techniques for the lateral movement and the uh, persistent so it going to check where you have access to the service token then does your service token already has the right authorization if it is then it is going to try to deploy the pod and if it is able to be successful for that it you, it lets you ssh or exec into that pod so this is a quick uh, demo of that uh, tool and it's it's trying a bunch of the options and eventually uh, it deploys a pod of attacker's choice which which eventually uh, let, let let the attacker perform the pers lateral movement and persistence in the in the environment all good uh, so we have seen uh, uh, different uh, different ways in which we can perform the container breakouts uh, different attacks uh, as well as the lateral movement persistence what about defense for that so this though this uh, some of these defense techniques are specific to kubernetes they are similar to the different attack that emmanuel was uh, describing uh, the first one is the uh, least privilege for your service token and it is similar to not having a privileged fact uh, for your uh, docker environment so especially in a kubernetes uh, environment whenever you are creating a service tokens and assigning them to a specific namespace pay specific attention to make sure that the privileges associated with that are just the least privilege that don't don't assign any uh, overly permissive pri uh, privileges there Kubernetes also provides you a way to use the pod security policy. Now, in the pod security policy, uh, I'll recommend that you disable all containers running as a root unless it is absolutely required, and then also disable the privilege pods again unless it is required, because then it will, though it will not completely stop the lateral movement and persistence, it will limit an attacker to the greater extent for that. in any pro in any uh, production environment your traditional knowledge of enforcing the network access control doesn't go away you still have to do it and even so you have to do it uh, even more uh, efficiently in a production environment uh, using kubernetes and then secure your container registry for the uh, with the different techniques like auditing proper access control with zero trust monitoring to protect the attacks that emmanuel was describing and one of the example that we also saw for the uh, for for the initial entry for, for an attacker and that's about it uh, thank you for attending uh, our talk hope you find it useful